So when we talk about meter in English, we're talking about patterns of stress and unstressed syllables that we organize into re regular alternating patterns so that we can create pleasing rhythms. There are several different ways that we can go about thinking about meter and several different meters that are most popular to write in in English. Now, we talked about iambic pentameter last time, and I want to dig into a little bit what that phrase even means, iambic pentameter. Well, whenever we name meters in English, and we owe this to the ancient Greeks and Romans, but I'm going to talk about English meter today and how it works in English, because it's a little bit different in Greek and Latin. But when we talk about meter in English, we usually have two terms. The first term, iambic, we use to name the type of foot that a line of poetry is based on. And the second word, pentameter, names how many feet are in the line. So, I want to start by talking about the different type of feet. Now, a foot is just a term for a section of either two syllables or three syllables with a certain metrical pattern within it. Now, if we have two syllables to work with in a two-syllable foot, and there are stressed and unstressed syllables, those are the two different types of syllables we could put into a two-syllable foot, then there are only a limited amount of feet you could have. Let's go over them. The most common type of foot that is a two-syllable foot is called an iamb, or an iambic foot. And that, as we talked about last time, is unstressed stressed. So da-da, where the second syllable is stressed, the first syllable is unstressed. If you flip that around, you get a trochee, stressed, unstressed, dada. So iams and trochees, or iambic feet and trochaic feet, are the two most common types of feet in English poetry. Now, of course, we have two other options. You could either have two unstressed syllables, not very common in English poetry, but sometimes it happens. Two unstressed syllables are called a pyrrhus or a pyrrhic foot. A foot that's two syllables that has two stressed syllables is a little more common than a purist. It's called a spondy or a spondaic foot. So if you want to make a line in English poetry, you need to choose what kind of foot am I, am I going to use primarily. Now, of course, using the same type of foot for most or all of the feet in a line is how you create a pleasing rhythm. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. That would be an iambic line. Da 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 da. That would be a trochaic line. It would be very difficult to make a line out of all spondies. Da 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 da. You can do it. It becomes very tiresome, though. It's even hard to read. What often works well in English is to have a line that is mostly one foot, but one of the feet, it's usually the first foot, is a different foot than the other feet. So sometimes you'll have what would be an otherwise iambic line, say, iambic pentameter, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and then you vary it up, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. This can kind of shake your listener out of a maybe too easy rhythm into perking up. Oh, wait, we started with a stressed syllable. We've been starting with unstressed syllables. Maybe that word is particularly important. And poets, being artists, know how to use slight variations in expected patterns in order to wake up to make people pay attention to what they're writing. Uh, maybe even in order to show that the content they're writing about is a little off or is a little variant or is a little tripped up. Shakespeare does this fantastically in his poetry often. So we have iambic and trochaic lines. Now, I mentioned that there's a second word whenever we're naming meters, iambic pentameter. Pentameter just means five meter. That five refers to how many feet are in the line. So da-da, 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 da-da. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? That's five iambic feet, so it's iambic pentameter. By the bright and shining waters. That's a line of Longfellow. By the bright and shining waters. That's four trochaic feet. Da 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 da. So that would be trochaic, not pentameter, because there's only four feet. It would be tetrameter. So, real quick, these are the, the main types of lengths of lines. You have monometer, one foot for the whole line. Da da or da da. 
pretty uncommon, but it can happen. Manometer, dimeter, which would be da 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 da, or da 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 da. Uh, this is, we find this more often. Trimeter, da 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 Often uh, nursery rhymes or very short lyric poetry, usually written uh, for children, will sometimes be in trimeter. Tetrameter, very common, da 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 da. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. A good iambic trimeter line. Or by the bright and shining waters. A good trochaic tetrameter line. And then, of course, our trusty old pentameter. Da 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 da. When I have fears that I may cease to be, before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high piled books in character hold like rich garners the full ripened grain. It's a quatrain from Keats perfect iambic pentameter with a little bit of variation here and there. He throws a spondy in, full ripened grain. Uh, we, have, we have several stress syllables in a row there where we have a spondaic substitution. Keats was a master, Longfellow's a master, Shakespeare's a master. So many of our poets from the past, especially like we said in a previous video, basically 1900 and before, so many of our poets are masters of several different forms. Iambic meter is the most popular in English, but trochaic meter by someone like Longfellow or Tennyson is sometimes harnessed with great power. Now, two-syllable feet and, you know, the trimeter, tetrameter, pentameter, these aren't the only metrical structures we can write in. We should also mention that after pentameter there's hexameter, uh, septameter, and octameter. But once you get into, especially past hexameter, your lines feel so long that it just feels natural to break them in two. So instead of a line of octameter, of eight feet, often that starts to feel like, well, we should really break it into two lines of tetrameter. Um, and you see this often uh, if you try and write in septameter or octameter. It'll often break up into, actually, that works better as a, um, as a tetrameter line and a trimeter line. Think about amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Those are alternating lines of iambic tetrameter and iambic trimeter. It's often, it's very common in hymns. Emily Dickinson wrote in these alternating four and three foot lines uh, pretty often, though she has lots of variations on that. There's another type of meter that we need to think about, which isn't as much written in English, but I think it can be quite powerful in English, which is uh, a triple meter or a three-syllable foot. Now, we, we have to stop thinking in terms of two, we have to start thinking in terms of three. And so there are two main triple meters that we write in in English. This is the anapest and the dactyl. Now, the anapestic foot is unstress, unstress, stress, da-da-da. The dactylic foot is stressed, unstressed, unstressed, da-da-da. So an anapestic line would feel very different than an iambic line. An iambic, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. An anapestic line, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Dactylic, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. A hickory dickory dock would be a good example of at least the beginning of a dactylic line. Uh, da, da 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 Now, hickory dickory dock sounds kind of, you know, um, a little childish, and often anapestic and dactylic rhythms work really well in nursery rhymes. And yet, some of the stateliest verse in English has been written in dactylic meter in particular. Dactylic hexameter is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's choice for writing Evangeline. This is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks stand like druids of eld indistinct in the twilight. This is the forest primeval. It's a pretty famous line. It's all in that da 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 da. Longfellow manages to take something that could feel too nursery rhymey and make it very sonorous, and it's because he's choosing very beautiful and smooth vowel sounds and consonant sounds. Hickory dickory dock has those harsh K sounds um, and the thudding uh, D sounds. This is the forest primeval. Very different feel, but it's the same rhythm. We can use anapests often um, in very sprightly and fun poetry. On the 18th of May, in the jungle of Newell, in the heat of the day, in the cool of the pool. 
those of you who read children's books will notice this is the first uh, few lines of Horton Hears a Who. That would be um, anapestic trimeter. Oh, it's actually tetrameter. So these meters, these triple meters or three syllable feet, uh, they're versatile, but they're a little harder to write in because we really are used to, and I think a lot of English words just often have alternating stressed, unstressed patterns in them. Not all of them, though. We were talking about our names. My name is Timothy. My name is a dactylic name, whereas David is a trochaic name. Um, if we think about um, Jessica, Jennifer, uh, a lot of a lot of these uh, kind of eighties and nineties names that I grew up with uh, are dactylic. Um, but Christine, that's a iambic name. So I hope this helped you begin to think about the different resources we have metrically for writing poetry. Now it could be fun to pick maybe a description uh, describing a tree outside and say I'm going to write about it in iambic tetrameter, iambic pentameter and iambic hexameter, and then I'm going to try it in trochaic, trimeter, tetrameter, pentameter, hexameter, and then in dactylic, and then in anapestic. It would be a fun way to figure out the different ways that you can write about the same thing in many different rhythms. I hope this has been helpful. We'll keep talking about meter and the wide world and amazing tools and just various abilities to stir us and to move us and to make us think and to organize not just our thoughts, but the very rhythms of our speech with formal poetry. Thanks so much.